man mindset. And then I want to discuss with you a little bit for the CFIs who are attending tonight, what their role is as an evaluator. Sometimes I think we tend to see CFIs only as instructors, but in the reality, they and often uh, toward the end of the training have to take off that teacher hat and put on their evaluator hat if they're going to help their students get completely ready for the practical test. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the key questions that need to be answered if you're an applicant or if you're an instructor helping an applicant and knowing that they're really ready for the practical test. So, you know, here's a thought about why we test. If you look at the ACS uh, in, in terms of its process, it's we're trying to make sure that the applicant, when they go through the gate into the national airspace system, that they have the knowledge and the ability to manage the task and the skills that are necessary to and safely conduct the flights that they're going to make under the privileges that they're given and under the certificate of rating they're being uh, and given as part of our uh, testing exercise and their ability to act as pilot fans safely when they've got their friends and family aboard the airplane. So one of the things that I think bears sort of looking at in terms of setting the stage is what are the first time pass rates overall. And when we look at the private pilot first time pass rates, it's about half. And when we look at all tests that are conducted across the country, it's about two thirds pass on the first time. And you know, that's a little frustrating to, I think, both instructors and to evaluators. We'd like to see it a lot better than that. So I think it, it'll help us to look at how this is going on and what we might can do. And, and so why people are failing some of these things. Uh, first of all, this is not anything new. You know, this is the same old stuff. This is, we, we see people failing check rides for the same reasons that they've always failed check rides. First of all, they, they don't understand the nature of the test. And, and that'll become clear as we go along, I think, as to what I mean by that. And then they, they fail to prepare properly because they really don't know how to prepare properly. And they fail to utilize the resources that are available to them. And then they fail to take charge of the process. Remember, this is the applicant's test. It's not the instructor's test. It's not the evaluator's test. It's the applicant's test. To take charge of it means that they can kind of guide that process. And so the result of failing to do all these things is an unnecessary notice of disapproval. So a couple things that, that you might have heard, and I want to try to cover these things and just prove that, or at least explain that they're not true. One of them is that uh, there is this thought, I think, that evaluators or examiners are required to fail a certain percentage of applicants. And that is absolutely not true. The FAA puts no criteria on evaluators for that. Uh, the way we talk about it is that 100% of the applicants who are prepared will pass and really 100% of those that aren't will fail. And it, it really kind of takes care of itself. The, uh, the reality of it is we really don't have much of a problem with uh, evaluators generally running into situations where they're seeing a really high pass rate or really high fail rate. It tends to sort of shake itself out. And the other thought or the second idea is that applicants can't make a mistake, that it's sort of one and done. If you make a mistake, you're going to get a notice of disapproval and you'll have to come back for a retest. And that is not true. One of the things that we brief in the uh, pretest briefing is that you don't ex we don't expect perfection and the FAA doesn't expect it. Uh, that would be an unrealistic bar. The, the thing that we talk about is the mistakes that are made cannot be egregious or serious enough or numerous enough that they don't meet the standard called out in the ACS. But the idea that if you make one mistake, you're going you're gonna to fail, that's just absolutely not true. And the third one that you hear sometimes is that the evaluator can sort of make it up as they go along, that they can build the test any way they want to. And that, again, is very much not the case. The ACS is very much the roadmap to the practical test we are required to follow its guidance. 
And if you think about it, if the applicant is dialed into the ACS and the instructor is doing the same thing and the evaluator is testing per the ACS, everybody's on the same sheet of music and there shouldn't really be any surprises to it. But ever so often, probably more often than we wish, we run into people that, that really haven't looked at the ACS with any detail. So all of those things are not true. And so if we think about the uh, nature of the practical tests that applicants are coming to the evaluator for, it, it maybe serves a purpose to look at what it isn't. And first of all, it is not just a, a recap or an oral version of the knowledge test. That's already been done. When the, uh, when the people who put the ACS together uh, were talking about it, they wanted to move beyond the knowledge test and try the practical aspects of what a, a private pilot or instrument pilot would need to be safe in the, and effective in the national airspace system. So they wanted to move beyond the knowledge test. And it is not a memory test. It is not like the knowledge test in that it's multiple choice. And it's not mysterious and it's not tricky. As I said, the ACS gives us a roadmap to the test. So there shouldn't be any surprises. There shouldn't be anything in it that the applicant who did a good job of studying the ACS would not have found already in there and been prepared to deal with. So when we talk about the nature of the test, here's, here's what it says. The evaluator will assess the applicant's understanding by providing a scenario that requires the applicant to apply or correlate the knowledge, experience, and information. So there are some things in that that are real important. One is that you're going to be asked to uh, explain and correlate and apply information that you've already learned. Not just regurgitate the facts, but actually apply your knowledge to a scenario or a series of scenarios that will be given during the practical test. So this application and correlation aspect is something that oftentimes is just uh, missed in the preparation. The applicant doesn't expect that and they don't know how to do it because they've not had a chance to practice. And as I say, it uses a scenario or a series of scenarios to try to replicate the sort of conditions and situations that a pilot will find themselves in in the national airspace system. And it does expect that they be able to describe or explain things in their own words. So again, you can imagine the applicant who expects that he's going, he or she is going to hear a series of rote questions asking for facts such as, what is the takeoff distance to be expected under these conditions today? And when they don't get that, when they get a, a question, as you'll see in a moment, that expects this ability to apply or explain, it really, uh, sort of fries their bacon a little bit. So, uh, so part of this is they just don't understand the nature of the test. So uh, let me give you an example. So what the applicant might expect me to ask would be something like, how do you perform a soft field landing? Pretty straightforward rote question. But instead, what I might ask them is if the runway was turf and the area received a couple of inches of rain last week, how would that affect your plan? So that's a different question, and that's expecting the applicant to be able to apply what they know about soft field landings and say that would be the proper way to go at that in those conditions. So here's another example. You know, a road question would say, well, what inspections are required for the aircraft that you brought for the test today? Pretty straightforward, simple question. But instead, what, I, what might be asked in a scenario basis is, how did you determine the aircraft you brought was safe and legal for the flight today? So that's a much broader question. And it's not difficult if the applicant expects it and has had an opportunity to practice and rehearse answering that sort of question requiring application of knowledge. So here's, a, here's an example right out of the ACS. In the pre-flight assessment, task, it says the applicant should exhibit satisfactory knowledge, risk management skills associated with preparing for safe flight. And I usually uh, ask the applicant something like, uh, 
oh, if we walk around to Cessna 172 and I reach into the front of the cowling and I grab hold of the belt that's there right behind the propeller spinner and I say, uh, what is this belt for? What's its purpose? Uh, and then I might ask, if it breaks, what would be the result of it? Well, unfortunately, sometimes the answer that you get is less than satisfactory. I've had two applicants, uh, once I pose that question, look at me and very calmly say, well, that's the uh, fan belt that turns the propeller. And I said, hmm, well, that's really interesting. And, you know, I was very disappointed in that answer. I was particularly disappointed in the fact that the last one that told me that was a CFI applicant. So you can imagine what that meant. Let's go back inside and talk about this. All right, so under that objective, the knowledge uh, aspect says they should know the reasons for checking each item. And under the skills, they should be able to verify the flight, uh, the airplane's in condition for safe flight. So if we look at maneuvers, it says that the ACS requires demonstration of some key skills. And uh, we can't test everything that's in there. We, we just do basically a snapshot. So um, if we look at it, and, and one of the things that I'd like to, to certainly emphasize is that um, the maneuvers that are called out in the ACS are, are there because they connect, excuse me, they connect to some real world requirements. And, and you'll see what I mean by that, but it's important to realize that that is the case. They're not in there just to create something to test. They're in there because they replicate conditions and situations and skill requirements. They're gonna happen in the national airspace system. So the result of this was he had no takeoff briefing for that particular takeoff, didn't run his checklist, didn't recognize that he had abnormal performance, and didn't abort when it was clear that this was not working out. So, you know, it turned out to be something of a non-event other than it ended up in a disapproval for him. But hopefully he understood after the fact that that, that sort of lack of awareness could very easily result in an accident. All right, go ahead and give me the next one. So let's look at another example. If you look at power on stall, the knowledge required says a applicant should understand the aerodynamics associated with it and including the relationship between angle of attack and airspeed and load factor and so on and so forth. All right, that's what's expected that they understand. All right, give me the next. And then they should know the stall characteristics and the be able to recognize an impending stall in a full stall indication. You know, they should recognize it by sight and sound and feel. And, you know, this seems real basic and real elementary, and it is, but again, it's, it's surprising sometimes how poorly understood that is. And the applicant really doesn't have any understanding of what the airplane is feeding back to them as they're approaching the stall, as the controls become mushy, and as the uh, uh, airspeed decreases and the sounds outside decrease, that should all be an indication that, that things are uh, approaching the stall and they should be ready then to correct the problem. Because again, what we're trying to do is not teach them to win a blue ribbon for being the best staller. We want them to recognize the conditions and situations that can result in an inadvertent or accidental stall in time to do something about it and avoid the problem. All right, next. Keep going. And then of course, once a stall occurs, they've got to understand the fundamentals of stall recovery so that they recover properly per the POH in the airplane and not induce a secondary stall. So in the risk management aspects of it, you can see that they should identify and mitigate the risk, including factors and situations that could lead to an inadvertent stall spin and loss of control. And, and this is a really important point because oftentimes what I'll ask the applicant is to describe for me a situation or a setup where that might happen unintentionally and inadvertently. And they can't do it. They have rehearsed the choreography of how to perform the maneuver per the standard as if it's just one more thing to be tested. 
but they've missed that connection between the reason that's in there, which is to recognize setups for this to happen to them when they're not expecting it. And then the, the bullet points you see there, which is inadvertent stall recovery procedure. And in the case of power on stalls, again, this comes into a situation quite commonly where if the airplane drops a wing as the stall occurs, the tendency that they have is to pick it up with aileron rather than using the rudder effectively to control the yaw involvement. Okay, go ahead and next. And then of course the uh, recovery depends on trying to avoid secondary and accelerated stalls. And then we can talk about uh, elevator trim stalls and cross control stalls and the effects of things like high density altitude. You know, one of the situations that can set us up for an unexpected power on stall is probably not gonna happen at sea level on a cold day. It's far more likely to happen that the first time that a pilot takes that airplane to a higher elevation airport with a heavy load on a warm day, and all of a sudden he's not, he or she's not getting the climb performance they're expecting, and they realize the airplane's not out climbing the terrain and they can't help it, they raise the pitch, and that's where you get the inadvertent stall and possibly stall spin. All right, go ahead and give me the next one. So some of the key questions that might get asked in this area is what is our stall speed? Where might we be at risk? What might happen if we stall the airplane in an uncoordinated manner? And how would you recognize an impending stall? You know, not all airplanes have a stall warning indication. The Super Cub I fly doesn't. And so we learn to recognize that by all of these other indications that we talked about earlier, such as control degradation, um, decrease in sound, the uh, onset of the buffet, all of those kind of conditions that say, hey, things are not normal here and I need to be paying attention to it. All right, give me the next one. So the skills that the, are expected that the applicant be able to demonstrate are these, go ahead. Establish the situation and configuration as specified, and then maintain coordinated flight throughout the maneuver. And this again is where rudder uh, usage is real important. Set power is assigned no less than 65. Normally, unless it's a high performance airplane, my preference is that we do it at full power. And then transition smoothly from the takeoff or departure attitude to the pitch attitude that will induce a stall. And that keyword smoothly also would mean slowly. The idea is that we're going up at about one degree a second till we get to an attitude that will create the stall. We don't need to go any higher than that, just be patient. Keep the pitch attitude up there, feed in the back pressure until the stall occurs and then recover. If somebody gets anxious about the fact that it's a practical test and they pull the nose up rapidly, they'll typically go way up above the attitude necessary to introduce a power on stall, which makes the stall more interesting and makes it more challenging for them to keep the yaw under control when that happens. And it's just not necessary. Okay, go to the next one. And then maintain a heading and, uh, or a specified angle bank. Now, again, one of the things that I run into more often than I, than I wish we would would be I'll say to the applicant, all right, when you're ready, give me a stall and I want it out of a right bank. And they tell me that they've never done turning stalls. And I always find that discouraging because it's clearly right out of the ACS that it can be asked for either straight ahead or out of a turn. And in fact, accident reports would indicate that quite commonly it does happen out of a turn. So it's perfectly fair game to ask for it. But if they've never practiced it, they're gonna have a really hard time with this maneuver. So again, the instructor has to make sure that they've taught both straight ahead stalls and also turning stalls. Okay, go ahead. And then they're supposed to acknowledge the cues and I prefer that they tell me out loud, I hear it getting quieter, there's a stall warning, I can feel the buffet, there's a stall I'm recovering. And then of course execute the recovery in accordance with the uh, airplane flight manual or the pilot operating handbook. Okay, next one. And then once they've recovered, configure the airplane and accelerate back up to VX and VY and return to level flight. All right, go ahead. So, you know, one of the key concepts that, that I hope people will take away tonight is this idea that what we're really looking for is the applicant to take 
ownership of the whole process and to demonstrate that they can, that they're ready to be pilot in command during the scenarios that were given, that they take charge of the check ride. All right, go ahead. Keep going. So here are some of the questions that, that might be asked. You know, tell me about the weather for the flight that you've planned for us today. And oftentimes you'll get, again, a series of questions and answer to that question like, well, what do you mean? And I'll say, well, what do you mean? What do I mean? Tell me about the weather. Is the weather good enough for us to make the flight? And if it is, how did you determine that? And if you think about this, it, again, it's a simple question if you're prepared for it. If you think about when we call and get a weather briefing, the briefer uses a script of information. They start out talking about adverse conditions, then they go to current conditions at departure, en route, destination. Then they talk about forecast conditions, and then they talk about notams. They have a script that they're following. If the applicant uses that same approach to organize the weather information that they've gathered, then this is a real straightforward exercise. But again, if you haven't thought about it in that way or you haven't practiced doing that, this question tends to really cause problems. And then uh, I'll say something like, uh, okay, uh, take me to the runway. And, and then if I'm teaching an applicant, um, if, I, if I have a student, one of the things that I can do to help that student be better prepared to be pilot command is I can ask them to take responsibility for different aspects of the uh, training that they're undergoing. So once I've trained them up, or once the CFI has trained them up, I can hand off that responsibility to them by saying, take me back to the airport and expect that the student do everything necessary to get us back. Now that would be the CFI doing that, not the evaluator. Okay, go ahead and give me the next one. So how do we develop this sort of critical thinking with, with applicants and students? Well, one of them is we continually ask why questions. Why is that that way? Why are we doing that? What is the purpose of that maneuver? Okay, next. And then, of course, having a, an understanding of, of the practical applications of aerodynamics, um, helping students develop personal minimums, understanding systems and emergency procedures, and using effective scenarios. These are all tools in the toolkit of the instructor to help that applicant develop that ability to think critically. And, and if they can do this, not only will they do well on the practical test, but they're going to be better set up to uh, operate safely in the next national airspace system when they get out there. Okay, give me the next one. So here's, here's some other examples of, of key questions that might get asked uh, on the check ride. How did you determine the weather was suitable? We talked about that one. All right, go ahead. How did you select the heading or altitude for the trip? There are a lot of things that might go into selecting an altitude, airspace, terrain, uh, winds aloft, cloud deck, all those kind of things. So that question opens up the opportunity for the applicant to explain how they came about and, and what they decided to do in terms of setting up the altitude for the trip that we're gonna fly. All right, go ahead. And then instead of asking a, a series of rote questions about systems, I might say, can you describe the electrical system of your airplane and explain what might go wrong with it? And that's a really broad question. But, but one of the keys to this is you don't have to do this from memory and you don't have to stand up and do it on a whiteboard. The pilot operating handbook probably has a schematic for it and you are perfectly uh, able to use and encouraged to use resources such as that diagram. If it uh, is available to you, I highly recommend that you use it to help understand and explain how that system is set up in your airplane. All right, go ahead. And, you know, when we talk about this idea of in instructors, um, here's the problem, and I'm as guilty of it as any of the rest of the instructors out there. We, we do, in fact, truly love to teach, and we want to help students to do well. But there comes a point as we get 
further along in the training, if we want to develop this pilot and command mindset, that we sort of have to take off that teacher hat and put on our evaluator hat, even as an instructor. Okay, next. <clears throat> so if we look at the instructor as evaluator, uh, this is where we start letting that uh, student practice explaining things to us and proving that they can pull it all together. All right, next. So in terms of that, we, we sort of think about that we have to be able to teach the why questions to students early and often, okay? We have to formally hand off responsibilities to them. We have to use effective scenarios to let them practice. And we have to ask the right questions as we go through this. And we have to learn when to stop teaching and when to stop helping. And then instructors, I think, for the most part, really do this already. And that is encourage and model excellence in what we say and what we do as we interact with our students. Okay. So, you know, the part we always talk about is the real test doesn't happen at the check ride. It really happens when they load their family up and they go out in the national airspace system for the first time on their own. And so we have an obligation, both from a training and a testing uh, condition to make sure that those students are truly ready. All right. So with that, then um, let's stop screen sharing and we'll open it up for questions. And Ken, I'll let you run that part. Hey, Ken, I actually have a, a quick question. As a DPE over all these years, if there were a couple of takeaways that you see that are common errors that may make us a safer pilot, what would those be that are, um, you know, that just kind of stand out to you? You know, it's a great question. I get asked that a lot. And there, there, it's, it's a difficult question to answer because it doesn't tend to kind of aggregate into certain areas. Um, and it varies with the type of check ride. But if we talk about private pilots, Probably the, <clears throat> the thing that we see uh, from a skill standpoint is, is poor stick and rudder skills in some cases. And usually that results in, you know, or, or manifests itself in, in poor rudder control, particularly in things like crosswinds. Um, beyond that, though, from a skill standpoint, I don't, I, it just kind of cuts across the board. <clears throat> but the, uh, the knowledge aspect is really more what we talked about earlier in that ability, uh, lack of ability to really apply what they've learned to scenarios that they're going to run into. All right, anybody else have a question? Feel free to start your video camera and your microphone. Yeah, and I've got one for you. Sure. Um, I'm actually kind of shocked at the um, private pilot um, the first time rate being uh, rejected down in the 50%. Um, would you say that that has changed in the over time or has it, you know, for, for a long time been in the, you know, less than 60% pass on the first, the first attempt, I, I guess that's any trends there or is it, uh, has it really been kind of holding there? You know, nationally, if we look at trends over the last, oh, probably 10 years, it's been pretty constant. You would think that, that it would be changing, that it would be getting better. And, and it is a bit discouraging that it hasn't really improved very much from that. But I, I think the takeaway from it, Eric, is that, again, if people understand what they're going to be tested on, if they really do uh, take a look at the ACS standards, and if the instructors are well dialed into what's going to be required, those folks do really well. But unfortunately, that you know, I think part of the fault probably lies with the instructor community uh, not entirely understanding that, and then sometimes I think the applicant doesn't realize that they have real control over that whole process. Okay, I just didn't know if that was maybe a transition from the prior way of testing to perhaps the new the new way of testing, but it's no, like you know, I, it I, doesn't. Right, I, I have not seen it. You know, we saw about the same rate when we were using the PTS. Okay. So I really, mm -hmm. and in a way, I would think with the ACS because it is so much more granular. It gets down into the great details of each of the knowledge elements, risk management elements, and skills elements that it, it really should improve because the, the information is right there where the PTS was a little 
less helpful in terms of knowing specifically what was going to be tested. Uh, mm -hmm. and another thing that, uh, a little bit of an aside to that, in the ACS environment, one of the things that is real important to realize is that if the applicant makes a really good score on the knowledge test, that is really helpful in terms of how we will conduct the uh, practical test when the time comes. Mm -hmm. Under the PTS, this wasn't true, but under the ACS, we basically are giving them credit for the elements that they did well on the knowledge test. We don't have to go back and cover everything in there the way we did with PTS. We basically can sort of spot check the elements, uh, we have, we're required to ask one knowledge element and one risk management element for each of the tasks in the ACS. But if they made a good score on the knowledge test, that's gonna really cut down on the amount of material that we're gonna cover in the oral exam. So that's real important for people to know. Okay. Thank you. So one question I always had because I've, been told the old folklore that most examiners kind of make up their mind in the first five or ten minutes of the oral on how the rest of the exam is going to go. How much truth is there to that? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you know, generally, you know pretty quickly how well prepared that applicant is. And if they come in and they're organized and they, they sort of understand what they're getting ready to deal with. It usually starts well and, and goes along well, but usually when they come in and they're poorly prepared and uh, uh, they struggle early, it generally is really difficult for them to recover from that. Um, it, you know, it's a given that everybody's going to be nervous. And I think most examiners and evaluators try really hard to get people back from the ledge a little bit and get them to calm down and realize it's just a process we're going to go through and that, you know, that the, the uh, opportunity is there for them to do well, that, that again, we're not expecting perfection, uh, but, but some people are just, you know, they're just really nervous. And when they realize that the question they are being, questions are being asked, are not the questions that they expected. They were expecting rote questions and they're getting these scenario-based questions. That really starts them off poorly and they struggle early and then it just kind of gets worse and worse as it goes along. I guess that expectation of rote questions though really comes from back to the instructor community of maybe needing to prep the instructors more for what's coming on the test. Absolutely. No, that's a, that's a great point. And, and part of the purpose of doing this, and, and we've done this around the district and, and uh, uh, occasionally even at a, in national formats, is to try to help the instructor community understand these same concepts. Because they are, they are really going to be able to do an awful lot of good to help their applicants get ready if they, if they understand these things. And if they will prepare them by asking the same sorts of questions, using scenarios, and again, expecting the applicant to be able to demonstrate that they can truly apply what they've learned, then the practical test will be a, a pretty straightforward exercise. Ken, I've got a question. This is Marissa. Sure. Um, this is uh, whenever the CFI says you're ready for check ride, and it, it could be with stage checks or what have you. What uh, sometimes the applicant doesn't feel ready, and I think this goes back to my question on the whole check ride itis thing. And you know, do you trust your CFI when they say you're ready, or do you trust your gut? You know, I would say if your if your instructor has uh, good experience, if they've been sending applicants up. Uh, on, a, on a regular basis. I would tend to trust their opinion. I think it's very difficult, particularly at the private level, for an applicant to, to know uh, how much they really are ready and how much their concern might just be check ride nerves. So I think we have to depend on that instructor and their experience to, to trust that when they, when they believe the applicant is ready, then unless there's some very specific things that the applicant is 
feeling like they're just not well prepared about, I would tend to go with the instructor's idea and recommendation. That makes sense. I think it, it is a lot, have, has a lot to do with nerves more than anything. Yeah. Hey, Ken, this is uh, Rob Whiteside. I got a quick question. Um, I haven't done a lot of teaching. I'm a former military guy. I haven't done a lot of civilian time, but in the military, we tend to let the student run the entire check ride profile. And basically, you get from the beginning of the check ride to the end of the check ride without the instructor saying everything. They know what they have to, what maneuvers that they're going to do, and they basically run everything without any prompting. Do you typically do a check ride and say, okay, now give me a steep turn to the left. Now give me a steep turn to the right. Now give me a straight ahead power on stall. Or do you just want the student to kind of take charge, go through the entire, um, basically all the maneuvers that they're going to do and let them run, run the show? Uh, great question, Rob. I, I would tell you that from a uh, from an approach to the lesson, it, it, to, if I understand what I heard you say, I think from a from a CFI and student relationship, asking the student to be prepared and to basically be able to conduct the lesson, I think that's great training for what we're talking about here. Uh, when it comes to the actual execution of the practical test, I'm not going to expect that of them. I'm going to say to them when we get in the airplane, when you're ready, give me a steep turn, or when you're ready, give me a uh, uh, power off stall, something like that. Now, we may have incorporated some scenarios. For example, one of the things that happens on the private check ride is that we start out on a cross country, at, and then at some point there's going to be a diversion exercise. And that diversion could be a scenario where we're saying, okay, you just encountered adverse weather, or we've got a problem with the airplane. Now do whatever you would do if that really happened. But, but in terms of the, the execution of the maneuvers, generally for the most part, I'm saying to them, when you're ready, give me this maneuver. All right, Roger that. I mean, I, th I think if, um, what I recommend my student was, hey, you you be prepared to basically take it from takeoff to landing and execute all the required items on the ACS and, and have a whole profile in mind so you can get through the entire check ride without any input, um, without being told what, what to do next. And I mean, until a situation arises, like a divert, but unless you, if you have to. Well, one of the things that, that to your point, one of the things that we're really uh, I think most evaluators would tell you it's very impressive when they have a student walk in and demonstrate that readiness to take charge of the whole exercise. Uh, I just come off thinking that is just a great start to any of these kinds of exercises and, and you come away feeling like, well, this guy is really buttoned up or this, this person is really, uh, they have their act together, they understand what it takes to be pilot man and they're ready for it. All right, thank, thanks a lot for the answer. I appreciate it. Sure. I would just say that um, if a student is prepared to, to be able to do all the maneuvers in, uh, on their own and the, at their own command, that they'd be well prepared for the check ride, probably. And the next thing, I, I do instruction out of San Marcos, and one of the big problems I see is people are staring inside the airplane um, way too much and that you can fly the airplane a lot better just looking totally outside and um, I just wanted to ask if you have any um, tips on how to tell people um, to, to look outside more and that they don't need to be so worried about meeting the, the, the standards that the ACS sets forth of, um, you know, it, it seems like people like to stare at the instruments because they want to know that they're plus or minus 10 knots on their airspeed or altitude and, and all of that. Um, and, and I think it's a, actually kind of a human tendency for us to all want to be looking outside. And it's not something that I even learned until I was working on my CFI, like, hey, these steep turns or power off stall, controlling yaw and staying coordinated, all of that is much uh, easier to do by looking outside at the, you know, 
at the natural horizon. Yeah, it's, it's a great point, and you're absolutely right. It's a common error. Uh, one of the things that, that is so um, disconcerting when we see that is because you realize if they're doing it on a practical test where they know they're going to be evaluated on making sure that they're looking outside, you, you have to believe that when they're not in that testing environment, they're going to be doing the same thing. And it really is a, a situation that reverts back to the way they were trained, usually from the early parts of their training. If the CFI didn't emphasize that ability to fly by outside references and insist that they do that, then they develop very quickly and, and, and really quite normally this tendency to look inside where they can get information. And in a world of glass cockpits, there's lots of stuff to look at. So it's a, uh, it's a difficult problem to overcome unless it's taught properly from the beginning. And so, so that's one issue. On the check ride, one of the things that happens is that they, they've been, it's been beat into their heads that they've got to do clearing turns. So I'll say, when you're ready, give me a maneuver and, and they'll know they need to do clearing turns. So they'll make a 90 degree turn to the left and they'll come back 180 to the right. And then they'll come back to the original heading but they're not quite ready to start the maneuver. So they're piddling around, getting exactly on altitude, getting exactly on heading. Meanwhile, the airplane's flown two or three miles beyond the cleared area. And then they roll the airplane into a 45 degree bank, never having once looked in the direction of the turn because they've already checked the block that said clearing turns. And so again, you know, I'm being a little bit of a, you know, I'm on a little bit of a rant about it, but I see it a lot where they don't look before they turn and during the turn. And that again is just unfortunately uh, a training issue. That's just not what they've been taught to do. Yeah, and I, I try, especially beginning with students, I'll have them fly a lot with all of the instruments covered up. We'll just go, kind of just go out and have fun and um, take in those like sight pictures, straight and level climbs, turns, descents, do steep turns without any uh, any uh, instruments or anything. Um, but I do see it a lot, especially at the commercial level, people trying to get their commercial um, licenses and you're trying to teach them these new maneuvers and they're just so dedicated. You know, they got to set a course and a heading um, to find their 90 degree points and their 180 degree points and they, you just can tell they're just so glued on everything so I'll even just cover all the instruments up on them too and the one thing I tell people that which I I would assume is kind of true but I tell them that look if you're looking outside the window doing these maneuvers while you're on the check ride and you bust your altitude just a little bit or you know are a little off on your heading maybe even just a little outside of the standards the examiner's going to give you a little more grace um, even though you're not perfectly dead on everything but if you're doing a great job looking outside the window I would just assume that that would be the case. Well there, there are a couple of points that you made that are that are absolutely I, I think essential one of them is that, that it is uh, a wonderful teaching technique to cover things up like that and let the applicant or the student learn that they can fly the airplane on visual references. They don't need to be constantly looking inside. That's one. Uh, the other is one of the ways that, that one, of the, one of the things that happens if we do, we do tailwheel training and we do it in a super cub, which has a, as you can imagine, a very basic array of instruments. And the comment that you hear a lot from people coming out of more sophisticated airplanes and learning to fly the Super Cub is they at first are a little intimidated by the fact that there's so little information to look at. But after about 30 minutes of flying it, they realize that they have everything they need that they can get from what the airplane is feeding back. And all of a sudden you can see the stress level drop and the joy come in and they realize what pure fun this is. And at the end of that first lesson, usually what you hear is, 
gosh, now I remember why I wanted to learn to fly. This is just so much fun. So they've gotten back to the roots of basic, you know, energy management and stick and rudder skills, which is so important. And, and inevitably, I think that's why you hear people say that tailwheel training makes you a better pilot. It's not the fact that it's a tailwheel airplane and has very little to do with it. It's the fact that it's a simple airplane requiring stick and rudder skills and, and this feedback to energy management about what the airplane's doing. So that is exactly to your point about learning those skills and developing those skills really early on in the, in the flight training process. some of the more atypical airplanes that you've done a private pilot check ride in? You know, everybody's doing, you know, 152s, 172s, all that, but I'm just kind of curious, what are some of the more atypical planes that people have gotten a private in? That's a good question, Ken. I, I don't know that I've had a, a whole lot of really different ones. You know, uh, we do have people now learning and training and, and testing in, and for example, a Cirrus SR-22, which is a pretty sophisticated airplane. But people are buying those airplanes and learning to fly in them. And, and I've done uh, light sport aircraft, uh, some tests in those, which are sometimes a little different. But, but nothing really exotic. I've done one RV series airplane. I don't know what it was, a six or an eight that I did it in. Uh, but, but nothing real, real exotic yet. But there's still time. How important is it to communicate, whether it's from the instructor or the examiner, that okay, congratulations, you just earned your private pilot certificate, but uh, don't, don't walk away thinking that you now know everything about aviation. This is really just the start of the, the learning curve to continue learning everything else that there is to know. I think, I think probably the evaluators or examiners that I know are, are pretty good about trying to, to leave that message at the end of the process. And, and to have people understand, as we say, that the real test is gonna happen now that you go out in the national airspace system. And, and I think most applicants uh, understand that. I, I think many of them realize that, that they've, got, uh, they've got the bare minimum met, that they, they have met the standard, but they don't have that experience necessary to, to be able to expand their boundaries and they've gotta be thoughtful about that. And, and I think probably the lessons from the ACS with the emphasis on risk management decision-making tries to get at that aspect where in earlier days, the focus was primarily on skills development and being able to perform the maneuvers to standard. Now we put a lot more emphasis on whether something is a good idea and what we should know about that and that connection to why these things are in those uh, ACS standards and why they matter. So, um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that, and, and I think the accident trend tends to support that. Um, you know, I think we continue to do uh, overall in general aviation a, a really, really good job in terms of accident prevention. And, and I think the ACS and the testing and training that we're doing on balance is, is well done. Uh, but there are always areas that we can look for, uh, for ways to make it better. And, and to your, to, uh, a little bit of a different point, one of the things that I always love to see is when an applicant comes to the practical test and the a, a CFI comes with them. Uh, that does several things. It, it allows us to correct any uh, discrepancies that we might have in paperwork. Oftentimes it doesn't put us, bring us to a stop where we can't go forward with the test. And I think it, it helps the uh, CFI after the fact because we can go through a fairly comprehensive debriefing of what went well and what maybe needed a little bit of additional work on the practical test. And that's helpful to the, uh, exam to the uh, CFI to get that feedback right on the spot. Hey, Ken, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, this is Sean. Uh, I, I have a question on when, when you're performing like your takeoff and landings in, in the different ones, do you, like, let's say you say, hey, do a soft field landing. Do you, do you uh, just 
take off right from there? Do you do you do you do your soft field landing and then go to the end of the runway and and do your checklist and then do, and then you say okay now do a short field takeoff or do you sometimes stop on the middle of the runway and if you do does that student feel pressure to not have time to review the checklist to do the next maneuver or the next takeoff? Oh, okay. I see your question. Um, here, here's how I do it. Before we leave, I brief the flight and I will say to them, all of our landings will be to a full stop. We won't do any touching ups. If we stop and runway permits, we may come to a stop on the runway. And if you're comfortable, we may reset and do a short field takeoff from that point. But if you're not, feel free to exit the runway and taxi back. You're the pilot in command. And so you make the call on whether you feel like that you can do it from that point or not. So I leave but, it up to the applicant. I guess what I'm saying is, does the, does the applicant need to do their full checklist again before their takeoff, their next takeoff? Well, you know, they would have, they, I'm not sure I understand exactly the question, but let's say we did a soft field landing, we come to a full stop. And they then would, would, of course, do the after landing checklist. And so they could sit there and it would be fine with me if they wanted to complete the after landing checklist, make sure everything was reconfigured properly, and then get it set up. And I'll say, when you're ready, let's do a short field takeoff. So what I'm trying not to do is put any pressure on them to hurry. But again, I always want them to understand that if, if they feel more comfortable exiting the runway and, and back taxiing to the end and doing it from there, that's fine with me. Okay, thanks. That makes sense. Hey, Ken, I've got one. I've got another one for you. Uh -huh. Tongue in cheek here, but what would you say that we were good at when we took our test that we forget over the, over time? So what 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 what, 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 what do we know how to do when we took the test that we forget soon afterwards? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, nothing comes to mind. I, I don't, I think generally by the time somebody completes the practical test successfully, uh, they, they pretty well got the foundational skills in place. I think somebody asked earlier or made a comment about the commercial uh, and, and I, I, this isn't exactly your question, but I'll, I'll throw this out there. One of the things that is different about the commercial practical test than the private. At the private level, we understand that, uh, for example, coordination won't be perfect. It, it needs to be reasonable, but it is not going to be perfect. By the time the applicant gets to the commercial practical test, it is expected a much greater uh, level of basic ability to coordinate successfully. We might accept a little bit of sloppiness at the private level, as long as it's not unsafe. But when they get to the commercial level, if they can't, if they can't coordinate, if they can't fly with good stick and rudder skills, that's a real problem because we're getting ready to turn them out there to start flying people for a living. And, and I think the standard is a lot higher for a whole bunch of things, including those foundation skills. Fair enough. I have a question. Can you hear me, Ken? Yeah, I can. Uh, so you, we've talked a lot about your uh, interactions with uh, applicants. I was wondering, uh, in your dealings with CFIs, what, what you find to be the most common deficiencies or room for improvement with CFIs? Oh, boy, that's a broad question. And uh, there are the, the relations. Let me, let me start out by saying this. The relationship between evaluator and educator, between CFI and DPE, should be, and in its, its purest form, and most of the time, is a collaborative effort, not a confrontational effort. That's what we strive for. You know, we, we realize, I know DPEs realize it, and I, I hope CFIs do, that we're all in this together. DPEs are, are nothing more than instructors who have been asked to perform a different job. And we love to teach, we love to fly, and we really do want the applicants to succeed. So where we can collaborate with the instructor, then this works better all the way around. So I encourage, and I love it, when CFIs either come and visit 
or call up and ask questions or discuss things that they have concerns about, either before the test or after the test. And so that we have this ongoing working professional relationship where we're all after the same thing, and that is to help the applicant to be successful. And CFIs who, who do that, who are invested in that process, inevitably produce successful students. The, the CFIs who don't do that, who are either because they're new or they don't really have a relationship with DPEs, or in some cases, unfortunately, because they're just not that motivated, those are the ones that tend to have more difficulties with their students not doing well on practical tests. Anybody else got any more questions? This is Jeremy. Before we close it up, we just passed it. Ken, I've out. got a question. Yeah, how, how far out are you booked right now as far as doing a private pilot check ride? This is Rob again. Hey, yeah, Rob, I'm, I was expecting that question to come up. Well, it's an interesting, you know, it's a moving target. Um, I haven't been doing any testing almost of any kind uh, for about, oh, three weeks. The yeah, my wife says I got to go back to work though pretty quickly. So um, so I've got some test schedules starting next week. Uh, we are going to do it with social distancing in the oral part. We're going to require the applicant and me to both wear a mask, but we are going to start gradually resuming uh, testing beginning next week. The, uh, my schedule was booked uh, quite a bit before this all happened, and I had the month of May booked all, uh, blocked out because I had a trip out of the country, which isn't going to happen now. So right now, my schedule is not too bad. It's probably a couple of weeks out, if I had to guess, two to three weeks. Okay. And, and, and I've, uh, I've, I've been a military CFI. I haven't done a lot of GA. I'm teaching getting ready to send somebody uh to their first private check ride so if, if, if i wanted to fly with you and just do a mock like you put me through a private pilot check ride to see how that works is that, is that an option hey, we could probably work something like that out I, I don't know that you would really need to do it to that extent but i would certainly encourage you to come over and we'll sit and, and have a cup of coffee and we'll talk through any of the questions and and just talk about testing philosophies and so forth. And uh, by the way, that is something that most uh, evaluators encourage uh, always for the CFIs and the applicants to come and meet the evaluator ahead of the check ride. It helps reduce that stress of the fact that we're gonna be in this testing environment. It allows the applicant to realize it's just a, a guy that's gonna be sitting there with them and asking questions. And uh, and we, we really want to try to do everything we can to reduce that stress level. Okay. All right. That's fair. Appreciate it. Hey, okay. Ken, uh, this is Karthik Manny. I have a question about uh, just following up on um, training and requirements and things of that nature. How do you feel about the FAA's requirements in terms of what it actually takes to be a CFI? Uh, because oftentimes you have, especially in part 141 schools, people that are brand new who are CFIs teaching um, private pilots. And sometimes it might feel like uh, it's the blind leading the blind because it's an inexperienced CFI teaching a private pilot student. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I do. It's, it's a real challenge. It is. I, I get it and particularly in the environment that we were in before all of the problems with COVID-19, where you had such rapid uptake of pilots to the airlines, it, it really did not give the new CFI a whole lot of opportunity to gain a lot of experience before they were moving on. And so we end up with inexperienced CFIs teaching our beginners. And, but that to some extent has always been true in this industry. And, and it, it has the potential to create some real problems. But what I'm finding is that the 141 operations and the individual CFIs who embrace the fact that this is what they're gonna be doing for the next 1,000 or 1,200 or 1,500 hours, and they wanna to commit to being excellent at the craft, they do very well. They come up to speed very quickly. It's, it's 
whether they're on that track in a 141 program or whether they're not, if they don't embrace the fact that there's a pretty steep learning curve to move from being an effective pilot to being an effective educator, then they're going to struggle with it. Uh, we all struggled with it. And I, I tell new CFI applicants when we complete their CFI check ride that, you know, here's the unfortunate truth. The first two or three students that you teach are going to suffer horribly at your hands. Because mine did. Every CFI I know, would, if they're honest, will admit to it. The, it's a difficult job. And the only way to gain the experience is to get out there and do it. You do the best you can trying to be prepared and you take it very seriously and you become invested in your students and you try to do everything you can to foster their development. If you take it, if you take that sort of an approach to it, the, uh, the CFI will become uh, quite effective as a teacher very quickly. If you don't, then, then there's a potential to do real damage to the students. Do you feel that there's any uh, need for change in terms of the requirements for um, getting the CFI rating, or do you feel that the way it is right now, it's fine? No, I think it's, I think, well, a couple of things about that. The, uh, we're, we're still on the CFI testing, we're still operating under the practical test standard, although I suspect that the CFI ACS will be coming along before too long. But uh, the, the CFI practical test done properly is probably the most rigorous test that an aviator will take. And part of that is because there's so much information that they're responsible for. And it really is focused on that ability to, uh, to, teach, to convey instructional knowledge. And so if, if they are tested to the standard, that means that they've got the basic ability to teach then what they have to do is hopefully operate in an environment where they're receiving some mentoring and some guidance and good syllabus to use and so forth. And if so, then that can, that can shorten that learning curve and, to the point where they can become effective at teaching. But, uh, but I'm, I'm fairly comfortable with the standards that we expect of new CFIs. I think, I think the testing is very effective. It's just a matter of the seasoning that has to happen after the testing is completed. And there's just no shortcut to that much. You just have to get out there and do it. So in light, this is Lacey, in light of that question, I'm really glad that I think it was Robert that asked it, of newer CFIs coming into the network or the industry, however you'd like to call it. For those new CFIs that are coming in or CFIs that are, you know, trying to operate in that new environment where they strictly have their own experience of training to go based off of, what is your recommendation on the most cost effective and I guess best ways for them to continue to build their own knowledge and experiences in a cost effective manner while helping their students as they're, you know, going along and trying to build their hours or whatever it is that they're doing. Okay, Lacey, let me, let, me ask that, let me answer that in a couple of different ways. One, if it's an independent instructor, then the challenge is harder because they don't, they don't have the structure that they would get in a 141 program, for example. But in, in one of the tools, one of the resources that I think any CFI can tap into is the uh, instructor associations that are out there nationally, either the Society of Aviation and Flight Educators which I'm uh, a big believer in. They have a mentoring program, which any CFI can join in and, and hook up with a mentor who is readily available and who has a world of experience. Some of the best teachers in the country are involved in that mentoring program. So that's one resource. And I'm sure the National Association of Flight Instructors has something very similar. So whether it's through one of those associations or whether it's uh, less formal, find a mentor, an experienced instructor, aviation educator, who is willing and able to uh, allow you to ask questions and bounce ideas from and ask for help when you run into a problem with a student. That, uh, that was always real helpful to me, both as a new instructor and also as a new evaluator, to be able to tap into that cadre of people who had more experience and say, what do I do about this situation? And, uh, 
The DPEs are also a good resource for that. If you have a question, usually they're very experienced uh, teachers, and most of us, I know, welcome that kind of uh, ability to interact with the CFI. So, you know, call them up and ask, uh, is this a, is, is this student exhibiting something unusual or what thought might there be about how to help somebody over this obstacle that they're facing? Thank you. Anybody else got any more questions before we wrap this up tonight? Okay. It's a little bit of feedback though. Um, it's outstanding, even minus the uh, the bombing. But other than that, uh, the rest <laughs> of it was abs absolutely outstanding information. Excellent, sir. Thank you, Ken. That was great. Yeah, sure, thank my you pleasure. All. Thank you for your time, Ken, yeah, thank you and everybody much. else putting this together. Great info. Hey, Ken, thank you very much. This is very informative. Thank you. Absolutely. Hey, Ryan here, Ken. You know I can't leave without saying something. I, I, <laughs> I want to invest in some recent formula. <laughs> hey, how are you? Ken was my instructor uh, when I started back in uh, 2008. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, we'll see you some other time when we when we're allowed to shake hands, Ken. See ya. <laughs> All right. See you, Ryan. Okay. Do I have everybody? Okay, Ken. Thank you very much for that awesome presentation you had tonight, and uh, thank everybody for attending and participating for all of the wonderful questions. And uh, Ken VR, if you could go ahead and bring the uh, slide ten up. Okay, so there's been a lot of talk about wing credit and the FAA fast team and whatnot. For those of you who are unfamiliar with what the WINGS program is, it's an opportunity to gain credit to count towards your flight review. But the real big takeaway is that you get announcements on when there are webinars and seminars, such as tonight, that comes out in your email. Depending on whether you're in a geographical area where the workshop is coming out, or however you want to set up your profile. But go to uh, faasafety.gov, set up a profile, and then you can get notifications of when these type of events, uh, besides those that I push out on Facebook, uh, come out. And you can learn about the WINGS program a little bit more in depth. Uh, as I mentioned earlier this evening, uh, there is, this is a WINGS credit event for all of those who started from the beginning to the end. So next slide. Next slide, Ken. Cool. So again, thanks, thank you all. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I have a aviation YouTube channel, uh, All American Aviation. Go look it up, give me a subscribe, check out some of my content, and it's actually focused on promoting aviation education and the adventure and safety. And for those of you who stuck with me from the beginning to the end, Send me an email at flyallamerican at gmail.com because what I'm going to do is mesh the emails that I get from now to what we had at the beginning, and those are the guys and gals that are going to get wings put it. Check out uh, Ken Viard's pilot partner program at the link that you see there, and make sure to join us two weeks from tonight, May 6, 7.30 p.m., as Pat Brown from AOPA is going to present a presentation on non-towered airport operations, which will include how to talk on the radio. As I know some of you guys saw my post last week about that. But join us two weeks from tonight, 730, and notifications will go out. Um, again, I appreciate everybody's participation. This is a big deal for me and big deal for Ken and Ken, I can't thank you enough for helping out tonight. And uh, everybody, stay, uh, stay sharp, stay focused, and sooner or later, we're going to be through this COVID-19 stuff. So thanks, everybody. Remember to send me that email, and good night. Thank you, Jeremy.